Well, welcome to the History of Eliaskia one-on-one sessions. Um, your host, Junior Francis, alongside uh, my good friend, Eric Kohler. He's also the producer. Now, this series celebrates the Skia, Rocksteady, and the vintage reggae scene in Southern California and throughout uh, by way of insightful conversations with legends and modern day talent, including those behind the scene. And a lot of people working behind the scene, and we are forever grateful to all of them. Hence, whether you listen to this podcast series or watch us on YouTube, we want to say many, many thanks for your support. And please remember, it's your responsibility and your obligation to tell as many people as you possibly can or persons about uh, this wonderful uh, series. We are extremely honored, and I'm myself and beyond myself with joy to welcome uh, seven talented singers, musicians, and amazing women from California scene. In this wonderful event, uh, we present to you the cover-ups and women of LA Skia episode. Yes. I will now respectfully ask <laughs> my you, good friend and producer Eric Kohler to introduce this one. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to get all your names correct. Please forgive mm -hmm. me if I'm not. Um, in no particular order: um, Nina Cole, Stacy Gucci, Minnie Curum, Sarah Lundin, Nessa Refredo. Gina Rodriguez and Chris Verso. How did I do? Good. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, on this very special episode, and a special thanks to Nina for helping coordinate. Um, uh, we were right off the air. Junior and I were, were looking at something here. Maybe not the first time I met some of you, but because um, I think that was at one of the Steady Beat shows, um, courtesy of uh, uh, Luis, but. Uh, some of you will remember this club, Skabawa, for any of you who can actually see uh, who are watching this. Uh, right. So this was this was summer of 99 in Pomona, downtown Pomona. Uh, cover up shared the bill with the Allentons. I think, I think that's where uh, at least a few of you uh, raise your hand if you were at this particular show, if you if you can recall. <laughs> All right, so a few. Well, I should hope so. Did we play, did we? <laughs> yeah. <What>? Yeah. <laughs> and is that a flyer you made, Chris? Remember, we used to make our own flyers. No, no. No, I think. You made a flyer. I think. Was we that? Had... Was that the club that was like a tiki bar or yes. next yes. to tiki bar? Yes. Ah. Yes. Across, yes. Across, yeah. Yeah. Right, across, right, from... right by the glass house. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 In fact, it's. I uh, remember. It was, we kicked off the series. If you can, I'm going to turn my computer. If you can look right above Junior, Carlos Malcolm, Club Scabawa oh. opened in June of 99. Oh, yeah. Um, so we we kicked off with Carlos. We we did a series of shows. Uh, we, obviously, we you all were part of. Back right. and the Tiki Room. And then we ended it with a special uh, show from Laurel Aiken. Uh, mm -hmm. Months later, so it was it was it was pretty pretty remarkable. Um, and interestingly enough, we are back in Pomona again. The twenty twenty three we went back <laughs> uh, with oh. a heavy hitting show. And then the last show that Headcat performed was uh, back in Pomona. Uh, right. This time around the Glass House. I'm not sure. Yeah, was there a Glass House back then when you guys? Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glass House was down there oh, okay. for sure. Okay. It was right down the street. Uh -huh. Yeah. Pomona hotspot. Um, again, thank you all for for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, why don't we start, if you would, by introducing yourself. Uh, tell us what instrument you play in, or instruments you play um, and what group you were in, in addition to the cover-ups. And let's go and let's go. Uh, we're going to go according to our screen here. Nina, you first. All right. Hi, everyone. I was a drummer in the cover-ups. I also played drums in Tight Spot, another all-girl LA reggae band um, from the early 2000s. And I played in various other bands, the Red Hearts and La Dolce Beat. Wow. And those bands were based right here in Southern California? Yes. I asked because I've never heard of them. Hmm? Yeah. The old yeah. Scar Rock Steady? The last two um, were more 60s garage style, but mm -hmm. both um, Tight Spot and Cover Up, Scott and Reggae. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think I've seen both at least once, yeah. Nice. Welcome back, Nina. You, you were you were one of our first guests uh, many years ago on this on this podcast series, so 
Um, thank you. How about you, Sarah? Um, I played tenor sax um, in the cover-ups and then um, played tenor and then I think I started playing guitar in the, um, the Twilights, which is a ska band with many of the girls here. <laughs> Um, and then I think that's when we formed Tight Spot after that. And I played pretty much mostly guitar. Um, and then we also formed High Fever right. later. Exactly. <laughs> and I played sax and guitar. Um, and then I I play the drums also, but mostly in like indie rock bands and rock bands. Um, so that's that's pretty much that's pretty sure. much it. Chris? Um well, <laughs> uh, singer, songwriter, manager of the cover ups, right? And then, um, uh, and form, I don't know, founding member with Minnie. Um, before that, I've been in, oh gosh, like punk bands and indie bands. And then after we did The Twilight and High Fever, I was in, and also, another all-girl punk band mm -hmm. and now I have a band a dream pop shoegaze band that actually Sarah played drums in originally um and I sing and write and I play bass well I play bass guitar sing and keyboards I think in that band w for recording but I have a live band to play okay. but I just sing a lot of duties. <laughs> yeah, a lot of duties. Well, you know, it happens when you're starting your own band. So uh, how about how about you, Minnie? Um, so I'm Minnie Kerhan. I in the cover-ups, I played bass and I started the band with Chris, also did songwriting. Um prior to that, I was starting or tried attempted for years to try to start a bunch of um traditional ska bands with people all over Southern California. Um, some of the people from the cover-ups, um, Amanda, who played sax with us, she was in some of those bands. I think probably the best incarnation of all the, the stuff was uh, Brian Dixon. I connected with him. So he was playing guitar. We had like, I don't know, all kinds of other people popping in. Um, and it was great. I mean, you know, it was just never went anywhere. <laughs> so, um, and then I moved to the Bay Area after um, the cover-ups broke up and after finishing college. And um, I played with a couple of people up here, but none of that stuff ever ended up going anywhere for me. I feel like, yeah, cover-ups for my, my kind of, uh, as I say, my, my all Bundy moment. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> my glory days. <laughs> uh, Nessa? <laughs> um, I was not in the original cover-up, so I came along after when they started the Twilights. Chris found, brought me back up down I was in the Bay Area and I had uh recently relocated to LA and then I was in all the bands that followed the Twilights with um High Fever and Tight Spot I we played there was a band with Spiro um I played piano with those guys I don't even remember what that band was um I remember, remember what that band no I don't remember there was a couple different bands <laughs> we played with Spiro. yeah but that was fun and then I also um played with the champions and it was pre-pandemic and they're up in uh San Jose and I was down here in LA so I was skyping into band practice for a while and that didn't really work so well uh you know just because of the time lapse but I played a few shows with them up in, in Northern California. Nice. Excellent. Stacy. I sang in the cover-ups. And prior to that, I played in a project with Chris. I was playing bass. It was kind of more third wave, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And then... Before that, when I was in college, I lived in the Bay Area and I was playing in like a hardcore band that would play like Gilman Street kind of shows. So oh. that was, I liked it all. Um, like I came out of just kind of those, the music scene where hardcore bands would play with ska bands, would play with metal bands. So I just was always in the mix and just, I just loved music. So it was really great to connect with the girls and play them. Wait, before we go to the next person, I wanted to add, I was 
honored when the cover-ups did their reunion shows. I was able to participate in that. Yes, I, I would imagine. And, and we're going to talk about that as well. So I, I uh, actually, Gina, over to you. Then I, then I, uh, I wanted to ask a follow-up. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. Hi, um, Gina. I played guitar on the cover-ups. Before that, I was in the shanties, um, the cover-ups, Twilight. And I'm forgetting something else. And then the rhythm queens. Mm. We played like oldies. And that was that was, and it was all always all girls. Wow. So I, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, it was right here in Southern California. Uh huh. I, I, I miss yeah, I miss some of those bands. Well, um, real quick, and then Junior, we, you can go to your question. But but I'm sensing so there's a little bit of a maybe tell me if this is coincidental San Francisco. LA connection. Obviously, Nina, you're living up there now. Nessa, you were up there. Stacy, you talked about San Francisco. Is this just all coincidental? For yeah. me, it was coincidental. I just moved to Oakland because I was into the East Bay hardcore scene at that time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I met uh, the girls in the late 90s. So, Got it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, same. I mean, I was, I'm, I'm from LA. Yeah. And I moved up. I moved up to the Bay Area to go to school, and that's uh, when the cover-ups was going on. And then when I moved back, the cover-ups said um, we're no longer playing together. But then the next band started happening, and I jumped in at that time. So I think it was just coincidence that we are all coming and going from LA <laughs> and the Bay. Yeah. yeah, and I'm the opposite. Yes, yeah, so I'm from LA, and then I stayed there through college, and then I moved up to the Bay Area after that. So, and that's. And all the all the other sequential bands happened. I was okay. Yeah, not in Seattle anymore. <laughs> Just pass it in the night, as they say. Yeah, and uh, so this is a question for everyone. Uh, your baptism to ska, since you know, uh, it's the forefather or foreparents of, I guess, rock steady reggae, uh, skinhead reggae, and so forth and so on. Your baptism, it could go either way you wanna. Let's, whoever wants to go first. Yeah, whoever. In no particular order. One, Maybe two, three, should I do oldest person to you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I list. I mean, K Rock is what how I listened to ska. It was two tone. I love the Special is Madness, English Beat. Um, um, oh my God, yeah, them. I now I can't. Of course, it it. <laughs> I can't even think. But yeah, so that and then I met Nessa. <laughs> Uh, when we were working at Sears Service Center in, is that Northridge? Um, yeah, Chatsworth. Yeah, Chatsworth. And I was kind of like this messy, gothy, indie punk girl. And she was the rude girl. And we became friends, of course, because we both are chatty. And we kind of recognize the, the, the music person at work. And she brought me in. She was in the whole Scott skinhead, sharp skin scene. So... I just tagged along. <laughs> she brought me into the everything, and that's where I learned a lot more. And that was like 88, 89, right? Something like that. So that was my um, introduction. Nice. Mm -hmm. nice. I'm the next oldest. I think I am. <laughs> so, oh, or, um, I'm not sure, but. Um, a long time ago, Magic Mountain used to have free shows. And so like Chris was talking about how K-Rock would play these bands. I would listen to, um, I know public radio, they had these like reggae Sundays and my mom would listen to that. And so um, I really remember I was too young to drive and I begged my mom, mom, the untouchables are playing at Magic Mountain for free on Friday. Will you please, please drive me up there? And we drove up there and the boy in my class was in front of me. And I'm like, Hey, how, Ron, how'd you get here? He's like, my older brother took me. And he's like, who are you with? And I'm like, my mom. And he's like, your mom's the best. And I was like, Oh shoot. <laughs> so that was like my first ska show. Was like, and, and, and you heard of the untouchables from K-Rock? Um, I believe so. Or I remember going down to Venice with my aunt and just buying records. Like I remember buying Black Flag and I remember buying the Untouchables, the pink record and just going, oh, when I put it on, I was like, this is the 
best thing ever. And so I'm not sure if I had heard of them from K-Rock or it was just one of those things where I'm like, I've heard of this band. I want to hear them. Right. So even though you were a youngster, you had disposable funds to buy records. <laughs> I had a job <laughs> since I was 10. I used to throw newspapers yeah, right. and I, I just knew that anything I wanted I came income. from a really poor, like not poor, but my single family mom and three kids um, that if I ever wanted anything, I had to work really hard for it. So I would work hard and save my money and buy records. <laughs> oh, nice. a cool, cool mom to take you to Magic Mountain to see the Untouchables. Mm -hmm. Next up. Whoever wants to, I mean, it's one How about, how about, <laughs> Gina, how about you? I'll, I'll go. Um, I have six brothers. So, and a majority of them are all older than me. And they, um, growing up, they were always into punk stuff. And I guess one of my brothers came home with their, you know, ska stuff. And um, they're listening to the specials. And then all of a sudden, you know, they start more and more getting into it and getting into it. Like I said, I have so many brothers that they all played in different bands themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and they all became skinheads and, um, you know, I was their little sister. So I always had to follow them everywhere. And I was their designated driver. So mm -hmm. I got into everything because of them, you know, they're the ones that introduced me to this whole, this whole scene. And, you know, I was in high school and I had no idea. <laughs> so I was like, it was just so brand new and it was just like a different world that not too many people knew about, you know, no one knew about this, mm -hmm. you know, ska traditional you know, reggae or they were into like Nirvana or something, you know? So it was, it was nice to be different and it was really just the, the music just is awesome. So well, I guess yeah. the baptism was unavoidable considering that you had so many brothers. Yes. And I had a brother play drums for the Allentons at one point. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so yes you know i i have it's kind of hard when you have so many older siblings and they kind of like that was just in the house so you just you get into it and because of them i got introduced to everything they opened up a whole new world for me right wow all right um how about you nessa well, let's see. I think equal to what Chris was saying, listening to K-Rock, inter being introduced to like two-tone bands that way. I think I was in junior high. And so I was like, okay, this is Ska. The first, the first record I bought, my aunt took me record shopping and it was a record store called Big Ben Records on Sherman Way in Sepulveda. And the record I chose was, I think I was like in fifth, grade was the complete madness album um and i picked it because it came with two records so i thought i was getting a good deal like two <laughs> you know and it opened and had all those cool photos on the inside cover um and so then learning about ska i was like you know there was no internet to kind of google it and figure out what was cool so mm -hmm. i remember going to tower records my mom always had bob marley cassettes in her car so that was like my introduction without realizing it, I guess, to reggae. Like growing up, my mom had Bob Marley. But I remember going to Tower Records and being like, okay, how do I find ska? And I found the ska delights because the word ska was in it. And it was a it was a a tape. And um I don't remember what what record it was. Um but anyways, that was like the you know the first traditional uh, album I got and found out about the Scottalites and initially I was like wow this is ska like it didn't sound like the specials or the English beat and I was like oh, okay I guess I guess this is it so just kind of listening there and then I guess I was actually kind of into punk rock before I learned about ska and I learned about the skinhead scene so it was a skinhead finding out about like starting off punk rock then learning about ska and skinhead and then just growing up in the San Fernando Valley and all the kids here, we all just kind of found each other. Um, and yeah, that was how it got started for me. But there was a big scare scene in the San Fernando Valley, right? Yeah, I mean, there used to be a I club. Mean, a lot of musicians performed in that area. When yeah, there was say a, again? a lot of musicians, a lot of bands were playing out there. 
at that time. Yeah, there were. Like, equal to what Stacy said, the Untouchables were playing at CSUN all the time. I mean, I was probably in ninth or 10th grade. I met uh, Greg Lee then, and we met because actually my next, my two doors down neighbor, Carrie King, was dating a guy named Lavelle. And so Lavelle and his cousin came over. They'd walk a half hour to come hang out. And that's how I met Greg was through mm -hmm. my best friend. And so then, you know, we would just hang out and chat and whatever. That's a whole nother story. But we would uh, go all around the town everywhere together. And um, we met Lino that way, I think. I remember meeting Lino Trujillo from, well, you know, they, they evolved into Hepcat, but we would go to shows at CSUN. Um, the Untouchables played there a lot. Dr. No played there a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, we were in Northridge. So going to shows there was easy being, you know, kids. Mm -hmm. And then the country club was in Reseda and there was a million shows there. And mm -hmm. it's so strange now when you go past the country club now, it's a church. Mm -hmm. But back then they had punk shows, they had ska shows, they had every kind of show. They're so yeah, people models. actually come yeah. to the valley. Yeah. I'll, I'll I went to country club shows with you, Nessa. <laughs> a lot yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot going on in the valley back then. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, yeah. Some, some epic ones. I, I unfortunately missed out on most of those, but um, but I've seen I've seen plenty of flyers and, and, and talked to many of people who have been. Um, many, how about you? Um, similar to, to everybody else, apparently K-Rock was the, the way to learn about two-tone right, back in the day. I remember, um, actually my school when I was a kid, it was this really amazing performing arts school that was across the street from USC. So it was like fame in real life. Um, and one of the dance classes we did, remember they had like, you know, it was like free Nelson Mandela was the song. So we did this school performance for, I don't know, diplomats and stuff like that. Um, so I just remember kind of that's. I didn't even think about it till now, but that's probably the first thing mm -hmm. that I heard. And then hearing that stuff on the radio and all the T-Tone stuff that was happening. Um, and then I think just kind of, you know, thinking it was cool, but not really knowing where to find it. Interesting enough, yeah, the same story of like, you know, I remember getting cassette tapes of the specials and the English beat and like having a little Walkman, <laughs> listening to that and um, shopping on Melrose and, you know, whatever sh shops at the time were there and just being really infatuated with the punk scene in general. Like, I just remember being a kid, little five-year-old staring out the window and feeling like, okay, my aspiration in life is to grow up and be a punk rocker. Like, that was it. <laughs> so, you know. People would say, do you want to go to college? I'm like, I just want to be a punk rocker. Like, that's all I want to do. <laughs> that was my aspiration. So then I, I had friends um, in junior high and stuff that were all into punk and they went to local shows. And I mean, they're like, what, 13 years old, you know, taking the bus to who knows where all across LA. Um, and uh, and then there were some people that were into ska, but it was like all my punk rock friends hated it. So they would never come to shows with me. But then the specials played. Um, at the palace in was it 93 94 93 I don't know that was my first ska show so I was like amazing mm -hmm. um so I did that and then I remember too back when I was a kid my sister's best friend her mother um was British and she actually was I guess lived in Jamaica or was connected with Jamaican musicians and so she had a huge vinyl collection so I used to listen to I mean mostly like root stuff but we'd always go over and there were certain records that we were the only ones that we were allowed to touch <laughs> we had to play and the other ones were off limits um yeah and then same thing Scott Alight, so you know of buying the because there was that one album that was a 90s like remake thing right do you guys remember that one I feel like it was yellow and red or so, something but it was a it was like it, whatever they had was like you know 1990s version of the Scottalites, and so that was my first. The high, high bump Scott or yes, 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 that one. Yeah. Um, and so that was the my first attempt at trying to get into traditional stuff. But yeah, going to all kinds of shows and basically, at the time too, it was before the Orange County scene exploded. So it was just if you're a ska band, you're playing a show, um, and it was you know traditional bands, two tone ish bands, um, third wave punk, ska punk stuff punk bands and then I feel like 
the Orange County scene started growing and a lot of those bands started getting bigger and then it kind of split and then I went into the um, more traditional LA scene. On, on our boat, what uh, year? Um, Approximately. Doesn't have to be specific, you know. Early to mid 90s, early to late 90s. So um, I feel like, yeah, because I think whatever, yeah, 93 or ish was the, I think the first ska show that I went to. And then, yeah, so a couple years after that and going out to the vet, just we go everywhere. I don't know. I'm like, I didn't have a car. <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but, you know, <laughs> some, someone did and they, I got to tag along and you got the, you know, you got gas was a dollar. <laughs> oh, God. Fish. <laughs> Uh, Sarah, yeah. how about you? So I was just realizing that I think I may have been the only cover up who is not a native Southern Californian. <laughs> so I actually grew up in Florida and um, I played sax forever since I was 10 years old and played in marching band and, you know, symphonic band and then played in jazz band in college and everything. And I remember my sophomore year, in college, um, some other musicians had formed a ska band and asked if I wanted to play with them. And I was like, sure, that sounds like fun. And didn't exactly know what ska was. Um, you know, it's Florida. We have really crappy music and <laughs> crappy DJs. <laughs> um, so, but the the type, it was third wave ska it was the style of music they were playing. And we had like, I think like three horns or something like trombone and two sax and a trumpet, maybe four horns. So it was really fun. Um, and I was like, this is really fun music. And then I moved out to California to finish college um, and really wanted to join another ska band. And then I put an ad in, or read an ad in the recycler, maybe. Oh my God, yeah. I think it was Chris's ad. Oh. Um, and I mean, I'm sure we'll talk more about how the band formed, but that was basically me getting into the band and then then I got introduced to traditional ska through basically all these girls. Nina used to lend me like stacks of CDs to, to listen to or burn. And, um, and I just fell in love with the music from there. Um, that's pretty much, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> so you didn't grow up anywhere close to Miami because uh, quite a bit of reggae. No, oh, okay. no I grew up um, actually in Cape Canaveral, Cocoa Beach, oh. where um where Kenny Space Center is. So it's kind of like, you know, a little beach town. And, you know, I listen to, to No Doubt. And like, then I think I started listening to like Less and Jake and, you know, the third wave ska bands. That's what we would hear, you know, in Florida. But yeah, it would have been nicer to be in a more, you know, cultural area like Miami or something. Right, right. Uh, last but absolutely not least, Nina. Right. So uh, lots of threads connect. So yeah. grew up in LA and although my older brother wasn't into ska, um, him and his friends planted the seed. Essentially, I was in a the riot girl scene with them and a band. I was in a band with one of his friends and she told me, hey, you look like a rude girl. And I didn't know what that was. <laughs> so I wanted to learn more. And they told me about some, some ska bands. And the entry point was more on the two-tone and, you know, third wave things going on at the time, or that, you know, the, the more punk side of ska. But then um, my first show, like many, was specials at the Palace with Let's Go Bowling. And from then, like that, I was I was totally hooked. Um, and I went to that show with another bandmate from another band um, who was my rude girl mentor. So she was a rude girl and I thought she was just so amazing. Um, she helped me with my makeup, helped me how to dress, you know, introduced me to more music. But I remember the first cassettes that I got was from, I think it was Columbia Music House. You could buy a cassette for a penny and then you got all these extras. So mm -hmm. they had um, Scandal Ska, which was the soundtrack to this movie Scandal, but it had the Scottalites, it, you know, the, the movie itself is about Christine Keeler. So that was one of my first, you know, 1960s Jamaican Ska recordings. And then they also had This Is Jamaica Ska. So I, I got my hands on a few things and that just really hooked me in. And then finding in LA that their bands like Hepcat and Jump With Joey, who, you know, 
have that more traditional sound. Um, yeah, I I went down that path, and that was my baptism. What a baptism! <laughs> indeed, indeed. So 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 a few of you have shared in in that baptism little little tidbits, um, where you heard the music on radio. A few of you also shared some live events that you went to. Um, for those for those of you that, that didn't touch on the live events, um, what was your live your first ska show that you went to here in in SoCal? So yeah. so so I know like the specials. So so Nina, you talked about specials. I think many of you talked about specials, right? Um, what was so so? What was the first ska show that you went to within within the scene, so to speak? I don't know what I went. I yeah. I went to wherever Nessa went. <laughs> I know I was gonna say. I think what do you like, remember? I rem I remember like going like to see the bone. Untouchables all the time at the yeah. Sun. Uh, <laughs> Fishbone played at the LA Street Scene in whatever year that was. Right. Um, shows at the Country Club. Maybe, yeah, I saw Fishbone shows. at the Country Club too. I remember seeing Bad Manners. At the country club, I'm falling yeah. asleep though. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> or like stories of certain friends taking my scooter in the back of the country club and jumping it off of a something <laughs> or other. But I don't remember my first ska show. I know that it was probably something like, <laughs> you know, one of the shows at the country club or, or Fishbone maybe at the right. Roxy. I don't know. It was eight like late eighties, early nineties. Right. Or like even um backyard oh. Sharpsville step in the backyard at Rammy's. Yeah. Like like that. So I don't know. Wherever you went, Nessa, I went. <laughs> yeah, I mean whatever was going on in the valley. I don't yeah. know. I think the first shows I went, yeah, I don't know. Probably Untouchables and Fishbone. But it was that was our our era though. Right. That was like, you know, a lot of I I don't I don't I don't remember like specials weren't even together then madness none of them were playing at right. that point right. you know they kind of came back I remember seeing the specials reunion or it was special beat and that was huge mm -hmm. we were so excited because yeah. like, oh, some of the specials are playing but yeah. before that yeah. they had been defunct for a while right. Right. I remember seeing Donkey Show in Tijuana. Oh, um, I, love Donkey I don't know. Show. I don't know if you came to that show, Chris. I remember like. No, well, I didn't go down there. Yeah, probably all the shows at the Country Club, like the, the Palomino. Oh, and the, the Palomino. Palomino right. Oh, the Palomino yeah. too. Another. And like parties, backyard parties. Yeah, lots of backyard parties. Yeah. So, Gina, how about you? Some of some of the first um, Scott shows on the scene. It's funny because I don't remember, but I just know I went, my brothers will say, this is where we're going. Cause that's when, you know, the flyers, they had the little map that was not <laughs> like, how you cannot find anything. Like it wasn't North, get out of here. Who, I don't know who drew that. Go ahead from Google. <laughs> yeah. Like you take out your Thomas guide and you're like, I think it's here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my brothers had their flyers, you know, so I'd be driving them, but we never stay long. My brothers um, seem to got it to get into a lot of fights back in those days. So I guess uh, we ended up numbers, right? Five brothers. Yeah, yeah. So my fam, my my brothers are like from the family, and they were always not well liked back then. So we'd go, they get in a fight, and I drive the getaway car, and so I. Don't <laughs> so when they when people. they had to leave, when they had to leave, you had to leave. Yeah, yeah, and I always had to like keep my head on a swivel, you know, but. God, I just, so I just remember so many like bands like like you said Donkey Show or you know like I remember King Willie or um, Lucky Seven like these old like small little bands that no one's heard of today you know you go back and it's just like when someone says something I'm like oh my god I remember that band I saw them where did I see them and I never remember and I probably only seen half of their show because I was probably leaving, you know, <laughs> working my way out the door. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of the 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 Valley shows or the or the near here, like Hollywood, was 
the Roxy shows and, mm -hmm. and the country club. And I mean, I think it was still in the eighties, like let's go bowling was coming down and playing. Um, like Christina said, that's when uh, Sharpsville step got started. That was the predecessor to Hepcat and those guys, I'm sure you guys already know that whole story. They were just Valley kids that got the band together for Sharpsville step. It was like Valley and Santa Clarita guys. Um, but so, so, so real quick, who, who from Hepcat was in Sharpsville steps? Uh, well, Destin played keys. Okay. Um, Lino played guitar. Uh, Joey Arquijo, who's now in New York, uh, played bass. Um, Narvis, I think, was the drummer of Sharp. What? Well, no, Narvis wasn't the drummer, was he? I don't remember if Narvis. Oh, he's gonna be mad if he was. That I don't remember. Um, we'll fact check. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rosie Calvano played trumpet, and then she kind of like when I don't know what happened to Rosie. I mean, I'm still friends with her, but at that moment, she kind of, I don't know. She went and went on to do different things. Greg Lee was playing trumpet okay. wow. at the time. Um, the singer was a guy named Ricardo from Santa Clarita, um, who ended up, I don't know where he ended up being like a telenovela guy, like an actor. Um, I think that's, so yeah. So it was Destin, Greg Lee. No, that's a fair, that's amount, a fair, right amount, there, right? a fair amount of yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. And, and uh, then they, mm, go ahead, sorry. Regrettably and sadly, the valley has been so quiet, been awfully quiet now for a significant number of years in terms of a traditional Skyrock Stadium. In uh, terms of anything, Junior, no man. one lives here. Like, I, I'm back in the valley. Christina just moved back to the valley, but I feel like everybody is either in the Bay, whoever lived here is either in the Bay Area or Long Beach. Uh, and don't let those Long Beach kids trick you. Half of them are from the 818. <laughs> I won't name drop, but yes. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what, let's get something going in the Valley. <laughs> the tradition is too rich to be abandoned. <laughs> we can't well, let go, but we have the dinosaur. You know who's doing stuff in the Valley is Jesse. Um, I don't know what's Jesse's last name, but he tries, yeah. he throws like- he Astro does, one, Astro Yes, yes. Yes. He's been around is, since back I, in our scooter, doing, sorry, scooter ride. I like riding. doing some stuff out there as well. Right. And yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, a couple of people are doing stuff out there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Dave and Davy, Davy yeah, does yeah, stuff. Yeah, too. right, right. He was trying to remember his name. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and then and there, I know there's other people. Like there was a pub we used to hang out at a long time ago, the Scotland Yard, and I oh, guess somehow there's yeah, some yeah. people doing stuff there again because we used mm -hmm. to spin records there on Sundays back in a long time ago, and right. it, mm -hmm. it kind of always kept kept its vibe, I guess. So let's call it revival, right? We're gonna revive the energy. <laughs> Here's another all-purpose question. So uh, did any of their female-fronted groups like uh, Box Boys, Donkey Show, No Doubt, Dancehall, Crasher, Ocean Eleven, Mob Town, The Dynamics, and later on, Save Ferris, influence or motivated you, uh, you know, to uh, start a cover-up? Or, 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 or any of the other bands, for that matter. Uh, we didn't or... mention uh, Body Snatchers. Right, or, or any of the bands from the UK, right, that were female-fronted, uh, Selector, Body Snatchers, or even, like, say, the Maudettes, any of those groups? And if so, if any of you can expand upon that. Well, I know that um, most of the bands that I like were, got, you know, guys, because it was more prevalent. Um, but I loved Donkey Show. Like, that was, I don't know. I, don't, I loved them. Who else was playing that was... I mean, selector. Mm -hmm. I liked. I just. I didn't. I think when we formed the cover ups, in my head, I was still kind of like two tone. But like, I loved Hepcat because of the harmonies, both vocal harmonies, were and um, like parallel with the horn harmonies and and horn playing. So right. that was more for me an influence. <laughs> I love the energy of two tone because I used to have a lot of energy and just need to dance and run around and stuff. Um, but then the more I learned about music um, and um, ska and reggae and rock steady, although I, I like really like skinhead reggae. I think it's, it's that 
the the rhythm, something about the rhythms for me. But um, yeah, it wasn't as much the women for me, mm -hmm. um, other than like Donkey Show. It was mostly the the male bands at that point, or even just bands that were not ska, like the Go Go's. Love the Go Go's. Mm -hmm. Um, but also simultaneously, I do love dance hall crasher harmonies too. I love how they um work together but yeah I think I think back I don't know it's like but I just didn't have as much exposure to the women band other than a little bit of body snatchers but at that point you couldn't even really get a lot of their no, music it was, good point it was a, you know like um imports you know you had to like and I didn't know about that I mean I knew what was it that came after the session bell stars or it or... Oh, yeah, the uh the uh Bell the, the, no it Bell was they were Bell? rock they weren't they weren't um ska or anything but it was Rhoda I think right she no. had another band I don't know um but yeah so for me it was more like the specials and madness then with the energy but then Hepcat really with the harmonies I just right. And the melodies and harmonies just so pretty. Um, sorry, sorry, other lady. I love you that's, still now though. <laughs> but that that's, but a wonderful, that's a wonderful prior, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Prior to the cover-ups, when Chris and I were doing our band, we did a donkey show cover. Oh wow. We did Mr. Brown. Oh. You I remember that. Wow. Yeah, we had we had so it definitely when the two of us were working, it was because yeah. we from that two tone. It was at the time when Third Wave was coming, but I I don't even think that that was a big influence on what we. No were doubt, doing. I really well, like for no you, doubt. yeah, yeah, I like No yeah. Doubt, but that their music is a little more hybrid than what I wanted to do, yeah. but. Mm -hmm. And just I did some real time fact checking. Uh, the Bell Stars. Bell Stars. Yeah, what, what was the spinoff, so to speak, from Body Snatchers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like exactly the opposite because my band, I've always just been in girl bands, mm -hmm. and I feel more comfortable even with, like you say, um, like Mob Town. Um, they're the ones that help form the shanties, um, because the singer, you know, we she was our singer first. And so, and their their manager Wally's dad was managing our band. Oh, and, I don't know if I knew that. Okay. Yeah, and really weirdly, Monique, you said say Ferris, she was in the band as well. Right. So, I've always felt more comfortable, you know, because having so many brothers and playing and everything, like, I come from a really traditional family where girls don't play that sort of music or you know I've always wanted to play the drums but my mom's like girls don't play the drums you know so for me it was like I always wanted to show people like girls can do anything you know and I was playing um uh, uh guitaron or uh harocho or whatever and, and um someone would say oh girls don't play that and it's just like so I've always wanted to prove that girls can do anything and I've always felt comfortable like being with the girls because guys are just I don't know <laughs> they have to get me so mad <laughs> you don't have to tell us we know. <laughs> so I love playing with came from yeah I think I so. love playing with the girls I always have now I always want to be in a band like I have I well I, some lineup changes in my current band but always have to have a girl because it just feels better it balances everything out but I yeah yeah, I think similarly coming from like the riot girl scene where most bands uh, are predominantly, if not all women, I was used to that dynamic, um, that energy. And then for me, even though I never got to see the shanties, I had flyers because I was already getting into ska. And that was such, that made such an impact on me seeing like all girl band, all girl ska band, like I want to know about this. I want to see them. <laughs> So, yes, Gina, you and your band, like, really, <laughs> this is something that's possible and, and really cool. We didn't think it was possible, you know, because it, you, it was unheard of. You right. know, you don't, you don't hear a bunch of girls getting together. Well, you know, God was like the 
the 90s. No one did that. So we were even like freaking out, like, how is this going to go over? And, you know? and and Gina, is it is it correct? I mean, the shanties were the first known all female ska group. Is that that is correct, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. as far as you know. And, and recording any recording? Um, we have we have a lot of VHSs because <laughs> you know back then you just all you could do is like pay someone to to record you, you know. And right. actually, Wally's dad was always he was great at always, that. Yeah. yeah, he always had his camcorder. He was always there filming everything. And I I don't think I think Alicia um, now she plays in Mobtown, but she might have recordings, but I think I lost like everything. And I, I'm so bummed out because of all the pictures and all the yeah. everything. And, you know, you know, when you just move so much, you're just like, I don't need this anymore. And, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> and now I already get there, everything. <laughs> if, there's any, if there's any time to f- try to find some of that, I'm sure, I'm sure Kat and Louise for uh, the Steady Beat film documentary would, would love to see some of that too. But um, no, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, I gave them the, the VHS because apparently they have that stuff. Right. And um, I'm like, well, I would like to see that, you know, because <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> right. Well, I just went through a move and I found a lot of stuff for us for the cover ups. I have some VHS from the whiskey and somewhere oh. else. So I got, I, got, I haven't watched it because I don't have a VCR here, but I, I I'm One. the keeper of all of our stuff. I have so a I got. VCR. I Next have one. Too. Okay, let's let's have a viewing party. And everything. There yeah. you go. Have a viewing party. Exactly. I love it. Um, Sarah, what about you? I think I missed the question because <laughs> my contacts were. I, it's that time of night. I got to take them out. No, 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 no worries. Um, Was the band influenced by uh, female fronted bands? Right. Oh, female fronted bands. Right. Were, were, were you, uh, were no, you no, motivated or influenced by? It? Um. Actually. I listen to a lot of male fronted bands. I don't, I don't know why in particular, but um, can't really think of any female fronted bands, um, ska or just anything in general. Any, uh, I mean, all of the above. Yeah. I mean, I love Phyllis Dillon. I think she's probably one of my favorites. Um, um, but yeah, it's, all I could think of at the moment. <laughs> and and many. I feel like for my stuff, I you know, like listen to all you guys talk to. It's um I think my sister and I were really close in age and we would just sing all the time. So anytime there was a band that had two female singers, so like B 52s or I was trying to think of like who else was it? It was um, Mary's Danish was another like oh, 90s. Oh, like any of the nineties <laughs> bands. I was like, again, K Rock, thank you for existing. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, so we would always just be singing along to things and dance hall crashers. I actually listened to one of their albums, I don't know, this past year at some point. I was like, oh my, I can sing along to every single song still. It was insane. And I haven't heard it in what, like 25 years or something. So um, I think for me, it was just kind of being able to sing along to to bands. So I guess in terms of like women musicians, I think it would be more along the the line of singers just because I like to sing. Um, and then, yeah, thinking for like all the other L.A. ska bands, I remember seeing Meal Ticket. Mm-hmm. They were from the Valley and they used to play out the, was it the Cobalt Cafe? Does that sound right? Yeah, there was a Cobalt. Out there. We played and, there. Uh, yeah, we did. We, we did played. Cobalt. We did. Yeah. Oh, we did. Yeah. We did. Um, yeah. And uh, say Ferris used to play out there. And so I think it's just for me, a lot of those bands, like I liked the singing. I think I remember say Ferris when they first started, I really liked them. And then I think it was as the third wave stuff started getting bigger. I was like, then I kind of stopped liking them only because I felt like there were some like stage antics and stuff. And I just felt like I don't know. When things start trying too hard, I just kind of, it. I don't know, doesn't, it loses, it loses its charm. And so I think there was a lot of stuff. And I think too, for me, a lot of times too, if it's like a, a girl band, it's usually like people trying to be tough. And mm-hmm. I think it's, which is really interesting about listening in the cover-ups when we did our reunion stuff in um, 2013, I was listening back on it with fresh ears. 
we were so sweet. Like it was just like really nice and girly. And, um, but I just, I think for me, it was like a lot of the stuff. Um, if it's women bands, I don't like it when they're trying to, to prove something. I just feel like just be yourself and there's no need to prove anything, you know? And, um, I, I think at least with the cover ups, I felt like we did a good job of just being us. Um, so I think that's kind of part of, part of it, I think from the music that I liked with women in it was, the stuff that carried over it's just they're just authentically being them and they're not proving anything they're just they just happen to be born female right. you know? right. um gina uh, just one one follow-up question about the shanties and then we're going to dive deeper um into cover-ups um who all who all was in the shanties so i know you mentioned uh the one of the lead singers of, of mob town what was her name alicia Alicia. And then I, I know Monique was one of them yourself. Uh, uh, Jackie Blue. Um, she later went on to the Israelites. Okay, right. Um, uh, this girl, uh, Stephanie, we called her Weasel. She was uh, the bass player. Um, I don't know where she's at now. Um, and we had a couple other members come in that were really good. And I don't recall their name, but one of them like won an like, award for singing. Like, wow. Was, yeah, I, I forget, but they were just people were just coming through like where like where are these girls coming from they're so right. talented you know like blew me away you know I was just like uh I'm gonna go practice over here because they're <laughs> so good you know like these oh. ladies they'd come in and they just like sang and they were just like their presence was just ah and I was just that's awesome yes and it's been so long I forgot a lot of their names oh, but I know they've been on to do yeah. a lot of really great things and 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 um how many years did, did shanties exist I think for only maybe two years we so, played so shows pretty, maybe pretty yeah. yeah yeah you said only you know uh that's a long time right and some bands don't don't yeah. don't, don't ever uh yeah. So we have some individual question now. Uh, so Nina, uh, what year is the cover up? Uh, what what year exactly the cover up was formed? And uh, your original member, sort of a three part question. And additionally, what was the South Cal scene like at the particular time? Uh, so we were just talking about <laughs> when we started, and um, Chris and Minnie were the the catalysts that got the band together and I guess they started chatting around 1997. The band with all of the original members was fully formed in January of 1999 mm -hmm. um, and many of them you see on this call so mm -hmm. Chris, Minnie, Stacy, uh, Gina, Sarah and then Amanda and Lauren who are not here on this call there were eight of us um and you know we started practicing started playing shows pretty soon after that uh starting with a birthday party at a, a lodge i remember um who's, and whose birthday party a friend rawls i think rawls i think it was i think rawls. it was rawls yeah. oh, friend rawls. he used to help us on guitar before we got gina he would help us on everything kind of he was he was one of our you know helper brothers Ghost member. <laughs> ghost member, yeah, for sure. We had a couple of ghost members. Yeah, we had some good supporters. Um, mm -hmm. And the scene at that time was really vibrant. So it still was that heyday of 1990s ska when, you know, the revival was hot. Um, Steady Beat was mm -hmm. doing a lot of things. There were a lot of shows going on. So being part of that, um, we had a lot of opportunities to to play and to play with bands we admired um, and kind of make our way uh, in the scene, which, you know, it is interesting as an all female band, uh, dipping your toes out there, how people are going to react. And um, sometimes it was a mixed bag, but other times, you know, people really liked us and supported us. So uh, it was an exciting time. And Nina, weren't we we were playing like twice a month? I feel like we were playing all the time or every other weekend or something mm -hmm. to remember us playing a lot. <laughs> we got invited to a lot of shows. I've never been in a band that's played that 
that often, that frequently. Was, since. There was a lot of shows. Like, wasn't there like every there, Friday night yeah. the beach and like, and that was just one of the shows per week. Right, right? Yeah. Was there were those shows and then there were dances too that there was so much going on at the time. And there was like not did we play non scotch people like oh we just yeah we, we played like random little bar things and we were always yeah. like Let's go dance and people were confused yeah, <laughs> yeah, we played bar. yeah it was like, like, why are there so many of you on the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh linda's doll hut yeah, Lin- oh, Linda's God. Doll, Linda's doll hut all it eight of so us sick. in this oh, little did tiny corner <laughs> it's a bar and, and then lauren was like 15 and i Felt like she, she, was she, she, was out. Like, she was sequestered, right? She yeah. had like her own <laughs> little corner, area. She like couldn't leave. Yeah. <laughs> That's you scary. didn't, I mean, we didn't, the only show that we ever had to book ourselves was our first show. We were lucky, as I'm finding out now, that people just wanted us a part of their show or whatever. We were so lucky the word got um, out really really fast and, and it got yeah sort of i mean we had people i mean this was early days of internet stuff um or websites and everything we had people who had heard of us in australia and oh, europe and it was crazy because we were i think at that time the only all-girl ska band i know there was mm-hmm. someone in australia maybe a little later but we were so lucky that we had so many opportunities but yeah, we did play a lot, but we also practiced a lot, practiced like twice a, a week, like, like mili- practices, right? uh, militantly, like, come on, guys, we got to practice. <laughs> but we also needed to be able to stand on our own. We were always at that time. Now I feel that women in music is different, but we felt like we needed to be better than better to just be out there to be taken seriously because we were all girls and that wasn't the norm and guys can be a little I think people could be a little judgmental or just oh who are these girls can they play so we wanted to practice to make sure that we could play and we had we did the best we could with songwriting and getting you know just our chops up um that I remember uh, (laughs) our schedule Right. So, so if you did two shows a month or you were rehearsing another couple times, like once a week or, or, or twice, more, a, week. twice, more a, week. twice a week, like two, week or like two hours or whatever. Yep. Sometimes we'd pick up a Saturday depending on if someone couldn't make whatever, but yeah. I remember doing like band practice out in the Valley. What was it? The yep. place that, uh, yeah. uh, what That's was that place? Good. It was in Van Nuys. Sound? Sound? Sound Arena. Sound Arena. Yeah, Sound Arena. That's it. And we go to we go to Taco Bell after. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we would. We would our, ninety nine cent our ninety nine cent dinners. Yep. <laughs> but, but I, I still remember. remember. I still I know Ness always remembers. I'm like I drove out because I don't live in the valley. I live in um in Norwalk, so it's kind of far. So I'd always drive two two hours to get there <laughs> for an hour of practice and two hours back home. Like. Yeah. We like, did more than an hour practice because yeah, yeah she definitely had the longest. I remember that. And we yeah. always stuck, stuck on the 405. Yeah, I'm like, sorry, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm late. I didn't know where else to practice though. Like I was no, just it was like, great. Oh. It was perfect. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, whatever. They loved it. They loved us. But I remember being at school. So I went to UCLA and I would shuttle all the West Side people to practice and then shut them all back. And then I'd go back to school. And because it was the early days of computer or well, heavy computer use, and I had to use the computer lab because I didn't have a mm-hmm. computer at home. So I'd be like, I don't know. I mean, it was kind of crazy to be like, I'm going to go to band practice for however many hours and come back and like work on my computer till four in the morning and get up and do it all over again the next day. Right, yeah. right. So, um, Stacy, so so I know that you all played a number of shows for, for uh, Luis and Steady Beat. Um, do you remember some of the venues specifically? There was there was the one in Long Beach when he would do Club Rough and Tough, right? Oh, mm-hmm. was that at the vault? Yeah, no. Leonardo's. 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 And then there was we played Chain Reaction with the Porkers. Oh wow! Um, I remember what the whiskey, a lot of whiskey shows, a lot, a lot of whiskey. whiskey. Shows, right? Yeah. Uh, we played a show somewhere in Oceanside. 
I can't that remember. That, that, that was, was a random. And ball. then what so, was what was the band that um oh gosh it what was it was at the end of Santa Monica it was a tiny little club where mostly rockabilly bands would play but we played a the show West there West and the only people that came were in bands so I remember Scott the came out as a came and the like garage. it was just the garage and the so garage. it was just like the most intimidating experience but it was so sweet because all of them were like, you guys are great. Nice. All of us have been there before. So right. don't worry because you're just getting started out. Yes. Interesting. I love that. When we played Warp Tour too. Oh, yeah. yeah. We played right. Maybe that, I was not, that was going to be my that next question. Next my next question. About <laughs> uh, of Warp Tour and what you remember best about it. Your I remember being stuff. really hot. <laughs> very hot. I remember <laughs> that too. Was, and I remember people looking at us kind of funny. Like they would walk yeah. up and be like, "What the fuck is that?" You know, like. <laughs> but so, 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 what, what year was that for Warped? And then how did that come about? And, and, how, many, and how many dates did you do? Just, Just Anaheim. Anaheim, okay. Well, so what do you mean? What do you mean? People would look at you as if you're from outer space. I think they just, they were like all girls playing this, you know, sweet gumdrop ska music. I just, I don't know. I just remember a lot of people would just looked confused when they would, because we played on this stage. It was kind of by itself. Remember it was like, like the lady, kind of thing. Like, like, by yeah. from like and a they big would, stage to, I don't know. Yeah. The, it, I think it was, I think it was called the Ladies Lounge. I know on Warp Tour. Um, no, it was like a tiki stage. tiki tiki stage. Okay, but I think it was, it was organized like by the girls that did Ladies Lounge. Because I remember. Correct. I don't know. I think we were before that. I'm not sure. I mean, hmm. we have it written down somewhere. <laughs> we have a poster somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I, I found it at some point i know um because chris you organized getting us mm -hmm. connected yeah because we, we well, got a demo tape i mean i think that was a really big thing was that we had a really yeah, good we demo. Had our, um, yeah, ryan dixon recorded us mm -hmm. at signet sound so we had this really legit solid demo and chris worked really hard to connect with people and get it out there so i think um people don't know how hard she worked and she worked really hard on that <laughs> um so she had a lot of connections and um she got that one set up for us. Yeah, that was exciting. Well, I'm friends with Kevin Lyman since I was in college the first time around in 87. I met him. He did a Chili Pepper show at Cal State Northridge. And I was part of this, all the, you know, all the like weird punk, goth, whatever you are, you know, stuck together. And we helped put on the show and I met him and we became friends. So I was friends. I'm still friends with him now. And I sent him our tape. I said, hey, we have a band. And he's like, you want to play Warp Tour? And I'm like, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> so we played that one. Um, it was really exciting. But yeah, that was. Well, um, but but also touch on, so um, the the demo that, that you worked on with Brian Dixon. Um, maybe, Chris, if you want to elaborate on that. Um, well, we wanted to record something, you know, and I don't know all that you girls probably will be able to remember. We all have our memories. I remember going in the middle of the night on weekdays, oh my God. recording at starting at three in the morning. Some of us worked, some of us were in school, some of us were in well, <laughs> high school, some of us were in college, and some of us worked. And he recorded us at no cost, but we had to do it in the middle of the night. And yeah. yeah, and yeah, it was it was exciting and fun, and Brian was so it was it was great. It was he, Jesse and him kind of at the console. Jesse, was like, Jesse Wagner. Oh yeah, Jesse Wagner. Yeah, because yeah. they were in the Rhythm Doctors at the point. Right. Mm, yes, Rhythm Doctors. That's actually the um on the Rhythm Doctors album. The there's like it looks like they're trying to make it look like a, a doctor's office, but it was actually the lobby at the recording. Oh really? Studio. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good sound. Because I just remember I'm like, hey, we were there. <laughs> so, oh. I just remember driving up and I'm like, who? You know, middle of Hollywood back then, dark, late at night. You're like, oh my god, let's just drive. This is the best car. neighborhood. Yeah. That was a little <laughs> dicey, but um, 
yeah and then and then um I had a dual cassette recorder and a dual um cd or it was I didn't even burn I don't know I didn't have a computer at, at that point or maybe I did but it wasn't mp3s bur burning on it was just cd to cd and tape cassette to tape cassette mm -hmm. and then we did the artwork and I would make the j you know buy the whole thing make the j cards in my not even laser printer <laughs> and we did it i still have some um in you know I, i'm the collector and the keeper of whatever nostalgia um but yeah and then you know we sold them at shows so there we didn't sell them online because we had no idea how to do that <laughs> I, I, have, I have was my, there, I have my ad, ad, online. I don't, I'm not sure if people were selling online. I don't think so. No, you know what? We had on our website, people we, was, would send us money because I remember. Oh, mailing, okay. So then we like, would send it. I made the help you make yeah. the J cards and stuff too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Like, the CD burner and I was helping burn the CDs. And I remember we would mail them okay. occasionally. Yeah. And, it, you know, across the country in some cases. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm paying for shipping, but <laughs> yeah, I mean that sounds familiar. Um, but yeah, Minnie, what what are who are some of the bands that you all played with back then? Um, a lot. I need to pull up our <laughs> the one that's popping in my head is like the Allentons and uh -huh. the yeah, I repeats, I repeats, I repeats, yeah, rhythm doctors, rhythm doctors, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, those are some of the top bands uh, yeah. of the moment, uh, absolutely of the day. Uh, Israelites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. We played with Mob Town. Do we play with oh. Mob Town? We no. played a no. show with the Porkers. Yeah. From when they came out from Australia. Right. That's right, right. Remember, there's some bands when we played at the the downstairs, the Long Beach one. There were some. Yeah. Bands. There's a band yeah. from Oceanside because they played that. And yeah. we played that show, and then they were the ones who brought us down to Oceanside, I, I believe. Yeah, I forget their. I have a. Oh, yeah, Shock the Mighty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, oh, yeah. Right, right. And then who is from Hawaii? We played with a band from Hawaii. Yeah. Where did you go? Jimmy Go, but that was Twilight. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Twilight. Okay. I don't remember. Yeah, because we played with them at the Whiskey. Because I remember asking, like, how far oh. was the drive? What um so 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 what led to the the cover ups breaking up? Initially, initially. <laughs> age <laughs> <laughs> I, I would try to think of like yeah, fan drama and the arrogance of youth is the the line that i came up with <laughs> so, that's our official that's, that's probably a very common answer for for, yeah. for fans, i would imagine right yeah there was a lot of us a lot of us and, and i think it's yeah and I feel like in the back. we were you know, we were all in a... was there a lot of infight dog fight some. <laughs> I don't think any more than any other bands. I mean, yeah. there's so many people. Oh, it's a, it's another like, relationship, but time yeah. set. <laughs> yeah. And well, you know, logistically getting everybody together and making it all happen and coordinating schedules. And it's a lot to handle. Yeah. I think everybody also musical and, and, like musically. Yeah. Well, maybe. you know, maybe I've been slipping into unconsciousness. I'm still not clear as to why it was an all female band who made the decision. Minnie and I. Yeah, we okay. we that actually uh, Chris and I worked together at Nana, um, which is another cool LA, you mm. know, store. Nice. Um, and we, I was trying to start bands. She had been trying to start bands. We talked about, you know, well, we could do a two tone band one day or something. And and then, um, I just happened to know people, and she happened to know people. And I had been playing music with um, the other bands I was starting. Amanda was playing sax in that. And I met her at, in college, so um, she mentioned she played sax, and I said, okay, when you go home on, you know, whatever, winter break, bring back your saxophone and come play with me, and we drove to Downey, practice all the way down there, and all across the valley and stuff, too, with all those different bands we're trying to start, and so I knew Nina also, like, we had, we were friends um, from high school, or since high school, 
Um, and so I said, well, you know, I know Amanda and Nina and Chris knew Stacy and then Stacy connected with Gina. And so we're like, well, we basically have almost an entire band of people that we know. Um, so, for... Yeah. So then we just needed to find guitar and one more horn. Oh, and keyboards. Oh, keyboards was Lauren. You yeah. knew Lauren, right? Or no, Nina. Nina, did you know Nina? Lauren? Did she... Yeah. Yeah, so we just knew each other from ska shows and yeah. she board, so extended the invite to try out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah, so it was just kind of one of those things where we nice. just happened to know enough people that were available, and so then we thought, well, why not just make it like a legit all-girl band and just, you know. Yeah, but I think we, you know. we consciously, yeah. I remember consciously. The ad. Yeah, yeah the ad I yeah. responded to specifically yeah. said girls only. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> and I yeah, I mean, at that point, for sure. Because I know, like, cause Chris and I, we were you know, had tried other, you know, remember trying other bands, the uh, other things I was doing, and that was, you know. Uh, it, it, listen, it, it, I, I don't have to tell you all, but it, it clearly worked, and, and, and you all made, um, individually and, and collectively it's such an impact um so 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 you broke up when though what year 2000 2000 2000 and then fast forward you did reunite and what year was that 2013 is when we played the shows yeah and we, we were just from 2012 oh, wow. <laughs> yeah in 2012 yeah. 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 and was that this one yeah. Or, yeah. or steady beat. Yes. Yeah. Right. So herein lies the million dollar question. The next reunion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it should be ASAP, but okay. Uh, when... <laughs> Junior likes to put people on the spot. Uh, but that's that is a great question. But, but before we before we dive deeper on that though, so so 2013 you reunite. Um, how long in the making was that? A year. year. Yeah, because at that point, Amanda had moved back up to the Bay Area. And so she and I we were doing like once a month in-person practices and then everyone practiced on their own. And, you know, I think Sarah at the time you had small kids and Nessa had small kids and Gina. I didn't have kids yet. I was, she didn't, okay. I was pregnant when we played that show. <laughs> oh, right. Amazing. Oh. Yeah, so it was, um, we made it happen, which is kind of amazing that we could do it. So it was a lot of hard work and- um, And a regret? No. No, of just in general? Well, that laid the groundwork for the reunion. <laughs> yeah. so, 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 a <laughs> so after that show, did, did you, how many more shows did you do? One. Yeah. We did, yeah, we only did, we did- um, a pre-party show at Sarah's house was super yeah. fun. You know, friends and family. We did that show in LA and then we did one up in San Francisco at Slims with Hepka and the Champions. Right. And that was it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, yeah. Um, well, great great way to come back though. I mean, playing playing Slims with 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 arguably the the, the greatest on the scene in Hepcat. So um yeah. yeah. Very special. Um, Jim, you, you have some oh, wait, was question. It? Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's not going to win. He's not going <laughs> to No, no, no. I, I, no I, I, I'm going to move. <laughs> well, you know how Ventress, of course. <laughs> right, Nina? <laughs> no, I did mention to Nina about uh, Scamania. It would be nice to see you guys. So, uh, Nessa, take us uh, through, uh, you know, spin off uh, uh, of some of the groups. Such as the Twilights, High Fever, Tight Spot. How did the sounds of those groups differ from specifically uh, cover ups? Well, let's see. The Twilights, I think for me personally, I moved back to LA and Chris mentioned that some, some of the girls were still interested in playing and we, the sound was similar, right, to the cover-ups, like some of the songs, some of the same songs, a lot of ska and rock steady. Um, 
that was an equally large band, right? There were, must have been seven or eight people. Like we had no horns. Um, and that was how long were the Twilights together? A couple of years? I don't know. Maybe a year and change. That was yeah. shortly after then uh, the cover ups disbanded. Yeah. We played with the Agrolites, remember? Like their first shows. Yeah. I like I just saw some something that said 2002. So well, sounds good. And you guys were yeah. I would have guessed that. <laughs> sounds good. Yeah, and that was when Chris Murray was doing Blue Beat Lounge because I think is that where we played with the Agrolites? I we don't played, remember. We played somewhere on Universal City Walk with the Agrolites. Oh right. They, oh, yeah. I think that was with Bill Jimmy Go as well. That was yeah. the I mean, like I came on City Walk, right? And then, and then Blue Bee Lounge opened in uh, early, early 03. Okay. Oh, maybe yeah. like Tight Spot. I think played Tight Spot there. played there. I don't I think, think I think we played there a couple of times with Tight Spot. Yeah. And okay. Well, so, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say so Tight Spot, how did that group differ? <sighs> that was more scary, Reggae. Yeah, it was. Right. I'm just trying to remember no, who no was horns. in the band. It was a smaller band, so yeah, it was mostly skinhead reggae. And no horns. Yeah, that's when I switched to guitar. Was that deliberate not to have horns? Yeah, no, there wasn't horns in tight spot. Um, I mean, it, was it yeah, deliberate? Mm -hmm. It may have been because I think we were trying to be a skinhead reggae band. Oh, okay. right. and, and it's just harder to find more girls to play horns. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that's real. And then and then high fever. What, what was the sound for high fever? Was that was it? more. Well, that was kind of skinhead reggae esque and, too, right? And reggae, yeah, okay. and like more roots reggae a little bit, sort of. It was just it was yeah, the reggae. girls that were in LA after the reunion show. We just wanted to keep playing, um, so we did that for a little while, and we found another drummer and. The bass player from the Twilights joined us, right? Yeah, we played a couple shows. Selena couple was the drummer, right? And she's um, Selena. Jason's cousin. She was in the Vessels. Yeah. yeah, and it was just really hard to keep to keep people. Like it was so hard to find girls that were, played music at all. That we went through a lot of people that like played an instrument, but maybe weren't even aware of what ska or skinhead reggae or rock steady was. And so trying, just trying to groom people. And I just remember it felt like we kept starting over and starting over. Yeah. Well, once one person would leave the band, then the band just broke up because we couldn't find a replacement. Right. <laughs> and that yeah. happened with all Must the very, subsequent very bands. Challenging. Yeah, it's yeah. a unique sound, like it's a unique rhythm. Not anyone, you know, if you're gonna yeah. play <laughs> drums, not you know, yeah. you can't even like I was just thinking, like, oh, I want to write a Scotch or a reggae song, and I use logic, and there's no reggae beats in logic, there's no ska beat, there's none of that. And I, you know, like I like to write and have the drums in there because you can feel it. Um, and I, I have to like I'm going to have to go outside and download something from somewhere else. So, you know, nowadays there's that, but like back, you know, even a few, 10 years ago, it's so hard. You, you know, like Nina, Selena could play pretty good, but like who else? Like playing drums. Is Rosie, so Ro I know we had Rosie play we drums. We had to teach Rosie how to play yeah. that, that type. And she was a beginner drummer. I mean, you know, she worked hard, but like, you know, I think everything like singing is is you know like you could just sing harmonies and stuff, but I think everything else is a little more specialized. Like a, yeah. a ska rhythm a on a guitar, it's so different. Yeah, yeah. And then you're I like, like, I mean, regardless of gender, I feel like that's always been the hard part. Yeah. And for me, going from you know being in LA in the the nineties and you know, you'd go to shows and you talk to people, and everybody was friends with someone in a different band. So you know, like a lot of the bands like people played in lots of different bands just because we all were young and had energy and everyone liked to play. Um, so somebody always knew somebody, but there was always like the one, the one thing you can't find, you're like, Oh, we need someone to play this. And you kind of have to, to teach someone. And for me coming up to the Bay area after 
and you know in the early 2000s like I just could not find people to play the style that I was used to playing um there was certainly like a like a northern California sound that was happening and um just that LA sound is really you know trying to get as close to the Jamaican style as possible mm -hmm. I feel like it's really challenging to find people who really know what they're doing so right. on a deeper level, is it because of male chauvinism in the society overall? I think a little. Not more. I mean, I don't know. I I think for me, it's just about the knowledge of the music and um, being able to really nail it and to really feel it and to be able to capture the emotion. Um, and I think the thing that I notice a lot of times too with, um, I mean, even people who are in, you know, fairly like you know solid ska bands a lot of people play to rock and roll and so I think um especially like when it comes to drummers I and I don't know I just I feel like it is a hard thing to really nail and once you play with people or hear people playing it who can nail it it's really hard to for me at least to like lower any expectations of what is possible because I know I know what it you know I think, people are learning, like. <laughs> I think people are learning more often now though with the availability of a computer. You can go online and learn uh, the Mr. Nibs, you know, uh, Lloyd Nibs yeah. style of playing and master it within a reasonably short period of time, which didn't exist right. during the yeah. era. Yeah. You're came up. saying there's hope for me to learn how to play an instrument? <laughs> Oh, uh, you're doing <laughs> <many things. laughs> Always that, that was That was specific about drum. Oh, I see, drum. I see. Very specific. Yeah. yeah. You know, like whenever I think about doing any kind of ska reggae, I always think of these girls and, you know, the other two that are not here at this. I think that's the exact people I call. Come on, guys, I'm going to do this or I want to write a song like I don't, you know, I mean, I, I've been talking or casually talking for a few years with Lino and Greg Narvis about doing a project. We'll see what happens with that. But I go to these girls right here because they're a we have such a God, very long history. I don't know, 25 year, years. We have like this camaraderie still. We're friends. I mean, we don't, some of us talk all the time. Some of us don't, but we always are friends. I think women, since we're women, we have these types of relationships that are very unique to women. Not that I'm trying to say that men or women are different. It's just that one of the reasons why I think probably like Gina said, like, playing with women it's just like a different dynamic it's you know a bunch of girlfriends so I always think like oh I gotta call so and so because I got a idea you know and I just go to these girls women so does that mean you wouldn't take tips from uh Lloyd <laughs> no I would take tips from yeah anyone but uh, yeah no but I'm just saying as far as like who I feel comfortable and like we know how each other play sure. it's not like i it's a, an exclusive club but i just i don't know no, i think it was just something with us though. there was a, a special mix where we wrote you know with the exception of what two songs or something that were covers we wrote all our own stuff so i wow. felt like we and we could kind of not read each other's minds but you know if i would come with chords you know it, it would be like not necessarily people would be writing for the parts that they weren't necessarily playing so like amanda might write lyrics i remember i came up with the horn melody and so it's just like there was a lot of we just were all kind of in sync and i think you know it was just i mean partly lucky i think to have this group of people but i think we just practiced so much more around each other and all we're listening to all the same kinds of music and um yeah i just feel like uh it was a good combination of people in the, the same room at the same time yes not always easy to find i tell you that in <laughs> any genre of music true it's not true, easy true. to find um Very true. nina um aka nina reggaedelic um you you uh many many fans uh probably know you as a dj um for, for the sake of our listeners um when did you start djing so I started DJing in the early 2000s, probably 2001 or 2002 was my first gig. 
Um, it was for something called Scadrophenia that used to happen in San Diego. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it was around that time. So it was after the cover-ups, I was getting into records while in the cover-ups, but really it was another way to remain musical while I wasn't in a band or was in bands that were different styles from um, the music that I loved. Uh, and of course I, I did DJ while I was in Tight Spot as well, but that was around the time when I started. So after the cover-ups, first gig. Nice. So um, Rocks de la Lauren celebrated uh, its 17th anniversary. W w uh, did you start uh, from the very onset 17 years ago? No. So uh, Rock City Lounge was started by Terry Lee and Chris Scootmacher, Rock City Chris. Mm -hmm. um, so Rock City Chris was the resident DJ the first couple years. Oh. And I came in, I believe, late 2008 or early 2009. Um, and was there for about, I think, four years because I, I left for school in 2013. But there for a good chunk of it. And it's so great that it's still going all of these years later. Mm. Yeah, it seemed like you were there for a lifetime. I thought it was like a decade. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Every week. That was part of the reason we did it every oh. month. Oh. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It really was. It really was a long time. Yeah. Um, so what is what is everyone's view on, uh, well, I, I guess I should first ask, how many of you still, whether it's regularly or semi-regularly, go to ska shows or or still are, are somewhat involved in, in, in the ska scene, so to speak? I, I, I sort of know the answer, but I don't want to make any <laughs> a lot of you. Oh, it's, going to shows is like going to a family reunion. Yes. You know, you see a lot of family, like you've known these people, gosh, since since I was 18 or something like that when you know and so it's like you see them and it's just it's like yeah going to a reunion like hey how's your kids how's this how's that you know and and to me I it's great it, I love it you know so I still I still go when I can you know it's kind of hard you have kids and stuff but you know <laughs> life commitments um what is everyone's take on the he healthiness of it and 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 do you think it's vibrant? You think it's it's uh, flourishing? You think there's some some exciting new bands? What what, what I'm curious as to uh, everyone's take on that. You know, I think from... it is coming back up again. I'm sorry, Nina. It, yeah. um, I feel like it is coming back up with there's because so many new bands are coming, and they're so good. They're so talented, and now that you know the internet you know you could hear yeah. it more than you could hear yeah. and people are, are inviting other people to invite here and then you're like oh my gosh this is so good you know like I, there's so many great bands out there now any any, any band in particular you're paying attention to or has grabbed your attention so to speak um what's that all girl band the one that you guys sent me to like Oh, Rude Girl Review. Yeah, well, there's, well, so yeah. There's, another, there's another one too with a another name, right? Closer to home. Maybe I don't. I'm sorry, I don't know. That's how. That as you can see, I'm probably one <laughs> of the ones who have not gone out. I would go see Hepcat or you know specific shows, but for years I've been working in concerts, so I would be working nights a lot of the times when shows are going on that's toned down but I still do work at a venue as well as have another day job so um it's harder for me to go to shows yes yeah. anywhere. that's a reality <laughs> right. mm. yeah I feel like, um, and then I, I was gonna say it just seems like a lot of dj nights so mm -hmm. um yeah, I, but I feel like, I don't know. I don't know if everyone's just getting nostalgic the last couple of years, but it just seems like things are kind of picking up. And I feel like, I don't know, are we all just like getting old and trying to relive our youth? <laughs> like starting to dress the part more lately? I don't know. Um, but I, yeah, I kind of feel like there seems to be a resurgence in the last two-ish years, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely DJ nights are like, to me, at least the big thing, and that was, you know, moving up to the Bay Area, saying I started collecting records because 
is, you know, finding people to play with is hard, but it's easy enough to collect records and just do something at a dive bar. Um, so I just feel like it's that whole DJ scene seems like it's pretty, pretty happening. Right. And you're playing, are you playing? I'm yeah. And records. Yeah. So I have, um, I'm partnering as part of it too. Um, there's a, a monthly night that I do in San Francisco and I think it's currently the longest consecutive reggae night currently, which is amazing. So it's been, I don't know, 12 years or something. Um, so and, we just realized that. <laughs> and, nice. and Nessa, you spin as well? No, I do not. I found that I cannot pay attention long enough. I love dancing. <laughs> if you've seen me, you know I'll be the one dancing from the first yeah. time the needle drops till they're kicking us out of the club. So <laughs> there's so many amazing DJs in this room with us and all around the scene. I hold it down on the dance floor. I yeah. DJed, I started a long time ago and was, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah love I, I, thought, I thought you briefly referenced earlier. Yeah, like yeah. Well, that's why I a long it. time ago a long time ago all right, you know, so you go out so oh yeah no i go out and i have a lot of opinions like in terms of why there's all the bands playing so much old bands if you just look across the entire music world i, I think it's like out of the pandemic yeah. everyone's yeah. just like itching to yeah. play because bands that hadn't played in a million years of every genre are playing again and yeah. then like in terms of uh just like local bands playing a lot of the bands we played with are still playing and like mm -hmm. you know tip the brim to all those guys that have kept it together not only hepcat but the yeah the, the bands that came a little bit later like steady 45s like it's amazing that they're still playing mm -hmm. um and i love going out i get out as often as i can i mean i i, see you out I personally that. like i have kids and i'm a school teacher but I love getting out. And to be honest, it's almost like there's so much going on now that you're like, oh, I'll go next time. Because there's always, it's like, you can't pick. Like all over town, there's guys doing stuff in Pasadena. There's people doing stuff in Long Beach. It's There's people down in Orange County. And it's everywhere. And it's amazing. And I think it's great. And I don't know, maybe that's just more common now to find DJs because it's easier um to just have to focus on yourself showing up versus a band of five six seven eight people and the whole relationship that goes with it honestly <laughs> right um but i think we're lucky to have everything that we have right now and it's it's cool it's crazy like like gino was saying the family vibe is like i've known so many people for almost 40 years and just to look back and know that like Oh yeah, I went to high school with them or we came up together in high school and everyone's kind of out again and, and hanging out and right. Maybe we all had kids and now our kids are old enough that we can get out again. I, and I particularly felt that and Junior and I had the pleasure of being involved with this, but what Derek Morgan Ocean Eleven show at the El Rey, which was the August of twenty. Oh yeah, that was yeah. <laughs> Like that was that was truly felt mm -hmm. like that family, you know. And but it seems though all the shows are like that. The Hepcat show, the people haven't seen each other for like almost right. two decades. Yeah, the pioneers. Yeah, yeah the, all the shows. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but we're we're certainly we're certainly mm -hmm. thankful here in Southern California to to have so much amazing talent, both both you know DJs as well as musicians. So, um, so so as we as we as we near the the uh, end of this conversation, um. What have we not touched on that you want to make sure that that your fans and our viewers and listeners know about about you or about about the cover ups or any of your projects? Should we say? Well, well, even if we're working on individual project, that's also well. We sense. are well. We're going to release our demo finally online, and we're doing a forty-five seven inch. Amazing. You made a cover up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, oh, our, it's our it's our 1999 demo so we're finally how many years later <laughs> we're gonna, it's good we're gonna put it out on you know spotify Bandcamp, apple everything and then we're um, making a, a vinyl record wow uh, so, as so well many, and we're going through steady beat excellent how many songs on the uh, uh on the ep 
you go. The demo is uh, six songs, and then the record's going to be two songs. Nice. And and any rough timing on this? Well, um, it's just a matter of business and getting things out and going. We're actually tonight or today was having conversations with Lewis. So we just have to finalize some business stuff and then wait for the vinyl to be made. We, I think we want to coordinate the vinyl as well as the online at the same time. And we're figuring out those details right now. Wonderful. That's exciting news. Yeah. I, I'm sure, I'm sure that was a long time in the making and, and uh, you all putting your heads together, but now that you've said this to, to, to the, the world, world. <laughs> I, I think I, I'm seeing a reunion too. Uh, <laughs> I think it comes with the territory. <laughs> no pressure. We're talking to you about maybe I was, doing a, yeah. a record release party or something and like maybe uh, need a good DJ or I don't know if we'll do like band swag and do t-shirts and stickers or something. I don't know. So if anything, we can at least do do DJ a DJ event or something. Certainly. You can, you, there can be some sort of celebration. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yes. And um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, so everyone is on the same page regarding the release. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We've been, taught, we've been, this has been, wow, a few years, but recently in the last few months, we've been really serious about it and we've been actually. What's the motivation? What? What's the motivation? What motivated you to reach this country? People keep asking for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. We have we yeah. have a Instagram and a Facebook page, and we get and then just in person, everyone is like, either when are you guys going to play again, or is there anything online that we can listen to? So we finally, you know, like it's hard with schedules and other projects and life and the pandemic, but now is the now we found the time. <laughs> Always the time. Well, that's 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 wonderful news. Okay, well, so, I mean, yeah. In addition to to that wonderful, uh, well, I see a lot of laughter and smiling in everyone's face. So <laughs> everyone seems to be in accord, so to speak. Um, they we're excited. Yeah, any, any... I think it's it's um let's say it's it's special too. I feel like you know at the time when we we're in the bands, um, people liked us, but. I feel like in retrospect, people really like us. And I just feel like it's really such an honor. And it's just so nice yeah. to have yeah. such positive feedback after all these years. And I think, you know, as you're saying too, about people going to shows still, it's like there is something to be said about this music and this this scene that, you know, people are really into it. It's not like, you know, there's people who come and go, but for the most part, you know, once you're into it, you're into it. And it really is, I mean, it's, silly as it sounds a scott for life i mean it's kind of true <laughs> and you know also also doing it for posterity for generations to come yeah I mean, that's one way of looking at it yeah it's yeah further, further documented yes yeah, for the kids yeah. your kids you know your that's what i was thinking it's a historical record i see what i mean i call it posterity <laughs> extend things yeah you know? for sure mm -hmm. yeah i'm i'm really proud of what we did i mean you know we i think at the time we were really trying to make you know like a mark like we can do this we can do this we were just we could be just as good as the guys because there was mostly all guys or the only women in the bands were singers or like one horn player but we're like we can do this and we were like a together thing and yeah looking back um and just like people asking now because I didn't maybe I didn't hear or see but I felt like we're more loved now than we were back then not, I'm not taking away from back then but or it's just age and hindsight and time but so many people are asking about it and want to see us play and and it makes you feel really good and like okay we did something that meant something to people so that is probably why I like playing music it's like you want to share and now people are like, we want to share more. So we're trying to share some more. <laughs> amazing. This is an amazing conclusion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, uh, one drawback though is that it takes a very profoundly long time to get the vinyl out. Almost right. like a lifetime. <laughs> well, we were because quoted. There, there are not very many factories that are uh, pressing records anymore. Um, I, well... 
our quote was only like a couple months, so it shouldn't be that bad. That's better. That's great. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, I'm sorry, you said a couple of weeks. Don't you say a couple of months? <laughs> well, no, not weeks. None yeah. of it is weeks unless you like, yeah. yeah. But not as long as um, like a full length, I think. Right. I think that's why. Yes. That would be. Oh, sense. I see. Okay. But we're excited. Um, Lewis oh, yes. is. Oh, yes. If Lewis from right. Steady. Yeah, he's been. Our, he's always been in our corner. He has, I, we've played the most shows, his shows. Right. I mean, I worked, I did a little pu uh, publicity for him back in the day. I found my, my- um, Where we met. Artist. But yeah, like he, we went to him because it just made sense. You know, he was always good to us. Sure. Really good with shows. So he's been an institution here in the South. Yeah. South. Indeed. So we're going to do the vinyl record through him and then self-release our own, you know, put up our stuff online, which, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just cover-ups. Fabulous. Brilliant. Well, any um, any other parting words here before we uh, before we call it a night? Anyone? Any, 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 any plugs? Any, any plugs? Uh... The only thing I wanted to mention is, I know Amanda's not here, but I think she's primarily the one in this group who has still continued to play in this genre of music. She's in a, in a band right now, right? Called Boom Draw. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she's just, you know more, Minnie. I mean, she's been playing pretty consistently, I think. Yeah, the past several years. Media. yeah. Yeah, she's been in, um, I mean, that's her current band is Boom Draw. And then she's in, she's been, you know, playing consistently in Santa Cruz with, you know, different groups and stuff. So. Yeah, um, I share a lot on social okay. media. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, uh, thank you for having us and mm -hmm. for all the women and girls watching, you can do it too. So yeah. mm -hmm. for more all girls gone reggae bands. So the, for, for those of you who are, who played, you know, uh, on the wheels of steel regularly, or if not regularly, where can people come and see you? You could start out, Nina. Yeah, so I have a night called Tip Top Reggae Club, oh, which is right. every fourth Sunday of the month at the Knockout in San Francisco. And then the night Minnie mentioned earlier, we have Bangarang Crash, second Saturdays at St. Mary's Pub in San Francisco. You're, you're quite busy in the... <laughs> mm -hmm. And Minnie? Yeah, so mostly uh, St. Mary's um, for Bangarang Crash and then the occasional guest spot here and there. Um, we have a couple of things in San Francisco, um, yeah, uh, follow uh, on Instagram, SF Reggae. Um, and usually people will have a, our little network of people posting Northern California events on there. So anyone yes. doing acoustic thing? Acoustic, no turn Oh, that's good. All right, all mm -hmm. right. Um, I mean, Chris has a band yeah. and I'm playing. Give me the plug. Oh yeah, well, two things. Yeah, Sarah plays in a band and I play in a band, um, not, Related to the genre. Well, I don't know. Dream pop kind of. I think it's right. like, I don't know. It's funny because some of my friends who are in Rude Boys, um, like Jesse Wagner, he is like, I love your music because it's very Brit, like Brit pop related. So yeah. I'm like, come out to a show. Um, and Sarah, you have um, a cover, like you play some covers um, right the now. Dark Lands, Dark Lands, yeah. yeah. With Steph on bass, who is yeah, in. Yeah, Steph, she was in the Twilight. So Tight yeah, spot. Spot. Right. and okay. Steph is playing with my band too a little bit. So where can people see you? Sure you bass player. What? What's that? Where can you be seen? Sure. Oh, um, <laughs> well, I'm playing at the Smell in June and trying to, and maybe Harvard and Stone. Like I play in LA. I'm trying to get down to San Diego. What I've noticed is mm -hmm. for this genre, there is like a scene for dream pop and shoegaze, and it's. You know, it's it's kind of tight knit. It's similar to ska and stuff, where it's word of mouth, but it's very hard. It's so much more elite. Whereas, you know, the ska stuff, it's more family. Like Gina was saying, it's like you know, like you're going and seeing your whole family and the guys and the girls that you've known forever. With the type of music I'm playing, it's it's not as much like that. It's more music, kind of. It's just a different genre, like vibe. 
Uh, but I love it. Um, it lends to my voice because I'm a soprano and I like to hold long notes out. So it's very dreamy. Um, so we have that and like we're sharing a bass player, Sarah and I, but who knows? We all play together, you know, we could always do yeah. it. Um, but I did want to say one thing that if anyone is interested in our, you know, release the the online as well as the record, please check our We'll have it up on our Instagram and our Facebook. Right. So it's cover up. Oh my gosh. The cover ups. It's it's not the Green Day cover ups. <laughs> it's yeah. cover ups. <laughs> Girl Star Band. So you just search that and it'll have our logo. Um we were first. <laughs> <by the way. laughs> cover ups. And us. a long, a long time ago when I lived in the East Bay, when Green Day started getting big, they had a different name that they used. And I remember being in LA when they were recording American Idiot, a bunch of our friends were hanging around. And I think I mentioned to him that I was in a band before called The Cover Up. So I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> somehow sat like in the back of his head, oh, we could use this. Cause I can't remember the name they used to tell their friends. It, that they played Gilman Street and we all went because they told us okay we're playing but it's called I can't remember but how ironic all these years later that that's what happened I know. we'll just believe that they remembered us and or that story <laughs> or they, yeah. oh well, that's a great name my great philosophical then... friend would say if you don't use it you lose it somebody has taken it <laughs> there you that's go so I know we got to keep it alive <laughs> that's right uh, well, uh, thank you all very much. Nina, Stacy, Minnie, mm -hmm. Sarah, Nessa, Gina, Chris. We really appreciate you all taking the time and uh, to talk with us. And uh, again, thank you for, for bringing so much joy in, in many ways over the years and, and, and for doing such groundbreaking uh, and influential um, and exciting groups like Cover Ups and, and Chanties and, and many others. And continued success to you all. Um, looking forward to the new project. Yes, looking With forward to, to hearing, hearing you on <laughs> digital platforms and, and on my turntable. Yes, uh, I'm going to play for my two daughters, who who I always encourage to uh, to play some instruments, and and and, and uh, I'm thankful enough that they know the difference between ska, rock, steady, and reggae too. Uh, so. <laughs> they're, they're extremely fortunate. <laughs> well, have them come to our dance party so they can yeah. dance. Let's make yeah. it all. Let's make it all ages. We'll do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. We uh, have to. No, thank you. Thank you all for making the time. To, uh, I want to say uh, thanks to all listeners for their ongoing support. And please uh, subscribe to this podcast series and our YouTube channel. Follow at History of LA on Instagram and join our Facebook page. This series is produced by Rockford Radio. Eric Kohler, thanks for your hard work, your dedication, and your devotion. And Junior, thank you for everything mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you for everyone out there for listening. And uh, Come on out or go out yes. and support. There we go. Please Local do your part music. to celebrate, preserve, and promote the scene. Come out, put on your dancing shoes, and enjoy yourself. And um, until next time, much love and be well, everyone. Ladies, thank oh, you. Thank so you. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Junior, thank you. until Thanks. next time. Bye-bye now.